Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Before I start, I would like to thank profusely the Schiller Institute for inviting me to this prestigious conference. I would also like to congratulate them on taking this very timely initiative for discussing these very important issues. The title of this panel is very interesting. There are two stories juxtaposed against each other. One is the Silk Road and the other is the Bricks. Both may not actually be connected to each other directly. But what is interesting is these two stories represent two fresh narratives for the 21st century. The first is about China's initiatives to bring about a radical change in the trading and investment routes in Asia. Schiller Institute itself had suggested a much bigger concept of the Silk Road a few years ago, as Helga had pointed out. And uh, that is actually the connectivity of the whole world. The second part of the title here is about BRICS. And that story talks about five emerging powers trying for a new multipolar or polycentric global order. As I said earlier, the two have different agendas and growth trajectories, but the two in their own distinctive ways bring new paradigms to the present day world. Uh, my Chinese friend spoke at length about the Silk Road. My area of speciality is BRICS. So I was thinking of talking about some of the aspects of BRICS, but even here I am at a disadvantage because my esteemed colleague from Russia has spoken so eloquently that I have very little to add. Yet I'll uh, try and uh, highlight some of the points which you already mentioned, particularly the evolution of BRICS and what is the glue that holds the BRICS together the BRICS uh, interest in changing the, or at least reforming the global order and the global institutions. And what are the options for BRICS and what are the outsiders' perceptions about BRICS? Now briefly, a little bit about the evolution. It is well known that Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs in a seminal paper in 2001 identified four countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, BRIC as the fastest growing large economies and hence the best investment destinations. But over the last 14 years, the list of good investment destinations has come a long way. South Africa was included in 2011, thus bringing in a member of the great African continent. Today, BRICS represents 40% of the global area, 30% of the global population, 25% of the global GDP, and 20% of the global market capitalization. In the beginning, BRICS had only three main agendas. Intra-BRICS cooperation, reform of the global financial institutions, and addressing issues concerning global order and global governance. The achievements in all three fronts have been quite impressive. There is a robust cooperation in areas of common interest like health, inclusive and sustainable growth, education, gender issues, urbanization, food and energy security, innovation, and skills. Intra-BRICS trade has grown 15 times in the period between 2001 and 2011, and is expected to cross 250 billion this year. This is still a very small part of the true potential. The five countries are exchanging information and learning from each other's experience and practices. On the question of the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions, namely the IMF and the World Bank, a small beginning was made in the G20 Seoul Summit in 2010, but further progress has been stalled by the US Congress. The evolution of BRICS in the last 14 years is best described as follows. Somebody said this. It started as an aspirational group and in time became a consultation group. Slowly it evolved into a negotiating group. And today, BRICS is trying to be an agenda-setting group. BRICS is not only a government-to-government -government activity. New ideas of cooperation are generated in the supporting mechanisms, like the BRICS Academic Forum, with which I am associated, 
the BRICS think tank council, the BRICS business council, and the BRICS civil society interactions. Now, what is the glue that binds BRICS? This is an oft-repeated question, particularly from those who are confused about the concept of BRICS. The confusion arises because of looking at this group in old paradigms. So far, the world has been used to groups based on geography, that is the European Union, ASEAN, SARC, African Union, etc., or based on ideology like OECD and the Comic Con, or based on commodities like the OPEC, Coffee Club, Iron Ore Exporters Club, etc., or based on technologies like the Nuclear Suppliers Group, the MTCR, etc., or based on ethnicity like the Arab League, or based on religion like uh, Organization of Islamic Conference, or based on language like Commonwealth or the Francophonie or the Lusophonie. Now, BRICS doesn't fall in any of these categories, and hence there is this confusion. Yet, there are some things common between the five countries. They all have played the game of globalization according to the rules already set by the developed countries and have made a big success out of it. They have all common problems of development, and new problems have arisen because of globalization like unequal growth. They all believe in multilateralism and inclusiveness. They all have common aspirations and a vision to have a greater voice in global affairs so that they can contribute positively to global peace, stability, and development. Spread, spread across five continents, the five countries are looking forward to building a geography-neutral global architecture. In the past 200 years, the biggest economies were also the developed countries. Also, for the past 200 years, modernization was synonymous with westernization. With globalization and the rise of emerging economies, this has changed. Yes, for sure, there are differences on some issues between the BRICS countries. Which plurilateral group does not have difference among themselves? You might recall that during the heydays of the OECD, there was intense competition between the US, Europe, and Japan. Yet, they cooperated effectively on certain strategic issues. Why can't BRICS do the same? That's the question the BRICS countries are asking. What they are attempting is to concentrate on the convergences and reduce the divergences. Now, let me touch upon this important aspect of BRICS and the new global order. What are the changes that BRICS would like to see in the global order? They certainly would not like to throw the entire system. Why would they do that and why would they destroy a system which has, which has benefited them to a great extent? But the fact remains that the global order needs reforms and changes. The post-World War II order has become outdated and the emergence of new powers who feel the existing order has certain biases and advantages in favor of the Western countries hardwired into the system. The world has changed and hence there is need to modify the order which should be and which should seem to be fair and equitable. The reality is that the geoeconomic clout of BRICS is not reflected in the geopolitical arena. As the scholar Ryan Bremer points out, the world has entered a phase of geopolitical creative destruction. Both the post-World War II and the post-Cold War orders have become irrelevant. The Russian scholar Dmitry Trenin rightly points out that life expectancy of world orders varies, but like human beings, they are all mortal. Many orders in history were changed as a result of wars and violent events. This time around, one hopes that it would be a peaceful process because globalization has created so much interdependence that violent changes are unthinkable. BRICS would like to address some of the fundamental aspects of the global order. These are recognized principles of values, norms, and rules. For these to be universally accepted, the optimum route is through a healthy process of multilateralism. One hopes that through these processes, we can work towards a truly multipolar or a polycentric world order. Connected with the question of the new global order is the issue of burden sharing 
by the emerging economies, which is often demanded by the status quo powers. Here, it's a question of the chicken and the egg. The argument of the status quo powers is that the emerging powers should step forward and take on more burdens before demanding leadership sharing. This, in fact, is a contradiction. The emerging powers have no intention in sharing burdens if it is to promote the existing order or the existing agenda. Why would they do that if it's going to perpetuate the current inequities in the system? Let me talk a little bit about the global institutions and the question of legitimacy versus efficacy. I take three examples of three global institutions which stand out as being totally anachronistic in today's world. These are the IMF, the World Bank, and the United Nations Security Council. The first two, generally referred to as the Bretton Woods institutions, have outdated voting powers, decision-making procedures, and selection processes for the heads of the organizations. The combined vote share of BRICS in the IMF is just 11%, even though they contribute 25% of the global GDP in nominal terms and 32% in purchasing power parity, that is the PPP terms. The collective share of BRICS in the World Bank is 14%. Here you can see the inequity in the system. Joseph Stiglitz brings out the deficiencies of the IMF and the World Bank in very eloquent terms in his book, Globalization and Its Discontents. It is in this context that the bold initiatives of BRICS to create two new institutions, like the New Development Bank and the Contingency Reserve Arrangement, attain great significance. Here is an example of BRICS stepping forward for burden sharing. The New Development Bank was a direct consequence of the decreasing availability of funds from the World Bank and other multilateral development banks for infrastructure projects in the developing countries. Similarly, the contingency reserve arrangement is to address the short-term liquidity and the balance of payments difficulties of developing countries without the intrusive conditionalities of the IMF. Both these have been conceived as additional facilities to complement the World Bank and the IMF and not to supplant them. Nonetheless, there is an important political message in the creation of these two institutions. They are financial institutions and will naturally work on the economic principles to be successful. But the fact remains that this is the first time in the last 200 years that a global institution has been created without the participation of the so-called developed best. This by itself is very significant. Many see this as a wake-up call for other outdated global institutions. Some even argue that had the World Bank and the IMF changed with changing times, there may not have been the need for the new development bank and the contingency reserve arrangement. The other anachronic, anachronistic global institution is the United Nations Security Council. Even if one grants the logic of the UNSC soon after the World War II, it is totally outdated in today's reality. There is no question that it has to be made more inclusive with a greater voice for the emerging powers. This brings me to the question of legitimacy versus efficiency. There is a specious argument given by some that for global bodies to be effective, they have to be small. This argument goes against the principle of legitimacy, which along with efficiency makes the two pillars of global governance. Efficiency without legitimacy will eventually lead to the unraveling of the organization. And legitimacy without efficiency will make it ineffective. Ideally, as uh, Dr. Langenhove says, in all global institutions, there must be three balances, namely balance of power, balance of responsibilities, and balance of representation. If we look at the global scene today, of all the global ex institutions, G20 seems to be the most legitimate, at least in terms of participation, because these 20 countries contribute to 85% of the global GDP. Now, what are the options for BRICS? In addressing global order and global institutions, in my view, BRICS has four options. The first is to conform. That is to go along with those structures which are fairly equitable. The second is to reform. 
That is to bring changes in global institutions wherever possible. The example is their efforts to reform the Bretton Woods institutions. The third is to bypass, that is to ignore those norms which are loaded heavily against the developing countries, so long as this does not amount to violation of recognized international law. And the last option for BRICS is to recreate. And the creation of the new development bank and the contingency reserve arrangement are examples of this. Hopefully, there will be more such institutions in the future. What are outsiders' perceptions of BRICS? First of all, does it matter to BRICS what outsiders think about BRICS? As far as intra-BRICS is cooperation, this is not relevant. But when it comes to the question of changing global order and global governance, this becomes very important because BRICS has to engage with others in a constructive dialogue. Fortunately, many in the West see BRICS in a positive light. The skeptics, however, can be classified into three groups. The first group as curiosity. They ask the question, what is this new animal called BRICS? The second group is suspicious. They are suspicious about the intentions of BRICS and how their initiatives will affect their interests. And the third group expresses hostility. Their argument is that since BRICS questions some of the existing norms, it could be a dangerous grouping. Now, in this context, it is the duty of BRICS countries to reach out to all the three groups and to articulate the BRICS point of view and to show them what they actually mean. For the skeptics to understand BRICS, probably it would be easier to follow what uh, the historian Jacques Barsin once said, and he said, to see ourselves as others see us is a rare and valuable gift without a doubt. But in international relations, what is still rarer and far more useful is to see others as they see themselves. So the skeptics of BRICS, if they see BRICS as we see ourselves, probably they may understand it better. And it is in this context that a conference like this attains great significance. Because this is an effort, an outreach to people to get more awareness about what BRICS is all about. Briefly, let me talk about this question of West versus the rest. Whenever there is a discussion on the reforms or on BRICS or on new groupings, the discourse unfortunately is reduced to a West versus the rest argument. This does not have to be so. In fact, this should not be so because any reform in global order has to be an inclusive process. Inquiry should not be interpreted as confrontation. Many confuse lack of changes in an established order with stability. But orders collapse when active stakeholders feel excluded. If we are looking for an inclusive and fair order, everybody has to be a part of it. In today's world, the reality is that the West needs the rest. Therefore, it's high time that we get over this syndrome of us versus them. Let me conclude by making one or two points on how I see what will be the future of BRICS. As of now, it looks bright. But the main raison d'etre of BRICS importance will be the economic performance of the five countries. We cannot run away from this reality. Of late, the five countries, uh, some of them at least, have shown a slowing down of their economy. So BRICS will have to register excellent growth rates for the world to keep an interest in this group. BRICS would also like to work in a practical and gradual and incremental manner. All the five leaders in the various summits have repeatedly said that their goals are modest and they will work in a very incremental manner and it will also be a very inclusive group. Hence, while it may not be prudent to write BRICS off, there is also no need to overhype BRICS, which could also be dangerous because the expectations may be too high. 
Uh, either of these can be avoided if one sees bricks as it is. That is, it's a work in progress and it's not a finished product. The intra bricks cooperation is bound to intensify and also extend to new sectors like internet governance, cyber security, etc. And on the global front, as they coordinate their positions on global issues, BRICS would be able to provide a valuable alternative narrative. Thank you for your attention.